So, hi, I'm Dershan Bezerman. I, um, I work at SP Capital IQ. Uh, I've been a uh, Haskeller for some years. Uh, I help with uh, sort of maintenance of Haskell or infrastructure on the Haskell committee. Um, and I uh, like this sort of stuff. Um, and this is, this is a really good turnout, and uh, I'm glad that. You know, talking about it, embracing fear and stuff, because I'm talking about stuff that is, is pretty difficult, and uh, we're going to go over it slowly, and I hope we'll be able to set a pace that'll be sort of people that know a lot and people that don't will both be able to get at least something out of it. Um, it's a really beautiful realm of work, and I, I just hope that this is going to be enough to introduce people to it, because... Uh, all right, how many people here have ever tried to read functional programming with bananas, envelopes, lenses, and barbed wire? Not bad, okay. How many people think that they really get what's going on in that? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and, and so, and, and, uh, so I, I, I started, and, and, and one of the things I think, how many people can name more than uh, three morphisms? Uh, Cata, Hilo, Zygo, Histo, uh, Dyna, uh, right? Uh, I like dynamorphisms, right? They, they sound like the Lost Transformers. Um, <laughs> now, um, so, but the, so one of the things is we learn, like, oh, wow, there's all these different, like, recursion patterns. But why? Why, why do we want to classify? Why? And it turns out a lot of it has to do with, and this gets lost when you only look at one of these or another of these papers, it has to do with a school of research, uh, you know, about calculating with programs, program derivations and transformations. And in these notes here, I've tried to give maybe not, maybe not the most recent articles, but 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 articles that sort of take you back a bit in the history, right? You have Mertine's uh, writing algorithmics in 1987, um, and right. So these weren't really research about Haskell, and it was only sort of research about functional programming. It was research just about programming in general and this sort of dream that you could specify an algorithm, algorithmics, in a very uniform way as opposed to pseudocode, right? And an imperative pseudocode with for loops. And that when you did so, the idea was that you could manipulate these programs, and uh, they, they call it calculating programs, and calculate with them just as one calculates with any algebraic formula, and you know, you know when you're taught you can give you know, x squared plus uh, 3x uh, plus this equals that, right? And then you expand it out, you put it into a normal form and so forth with uh, a formula. The idea is you can write programs the same way. Um, and uh, it turns out that when you start doing this, to talk about the laws, a lot of category theory comes up. And, and so I started reviewing uh, the textbook on this stuff, The Algebra of Programming by Burton Moore, a, a wonderful book. And I had, for some reason, thought that it was simpler than the papers. But it turns out that when they got the room to stretch out, what they decided to do is instead of taking twice as long to make everything more clear, they decided to put in all the category theory that was how they arrived at these results, but which all the reviewers told them, you can't put this in the paper. So they said, now it's in the book, huh? So um, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try to give a fairly category free, free, theory free presentation, which means I'm not gonna be able to get the deeper stuff in the book. And in fact, I'm only going to really have uh, one running example and one um, shorter um, example that, that isn't even going to get the way into the media stuff. And I figure that if, if we do that right, that should take the whole two hours. But it could be that I really miscalculated and we'll get to it really quickly. Or it could be too much. We'll see. Um, so we do need some for uh, It's a quote. I don't recall who it's from. It's, uh, 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 Raymond Brown, uh, uh, the mathematician, running them, uh, quotes it. It's from a magician. Practice till the difficult becomes easy, the easy becomes habit, and the habit becomes the beautiful. That's how I feel about this stuff. Because we're just going to be practicing and reviewing some simple concepts, and we're going to try to derive uh, one algorithm, uh, at least, which is uh, how many people are familiar with the maximum segment sum problem? Okay, this is a really beautiful problem, and, and we'll get to it in a bit. We've got to do some setups. Because it's an example of where you have an algorithm that appears that it's got to be about O and Q, and there's a linear algorithm for it, and and that was discovered back in the 70s, and it's now become the hello world of these sorts of uh, school of program transformations, because there's a way to take one and turn it into the other, proceeding entirely by mechanical steps, just as one would uh, simplify an algebraic equation, and, and hopefully uh, I'm going to show you guys by the end of this talk how to do that. Um, 
So, so yeah, the notion is, yes, yeah, so here we go. Equational reasoning acquires equations. And uh, we're going to level up our equational reasoning by uh, looking at equations more powerful than simple substitutions. Because we can all do some basic equational reasoning in Haskell, right? If you have the function, you know, head of a list or something, right? And you, you, write, you just substitute in the, the definition of the function, and, you know, just as one substitutes in the lambda calculus, and you expand it out, and you can show one thing that equals another. And do that, do that effectively just as the computer does it when it's running the program. Just by substituting and expanding and substituting and expanding, you can actually demonstrate you know, facts about your programs that way. But, but that's sort of longhand, right? We don't want to have to, that almost amounts to our equational reasoning is the same on the computer performs when it runs the program. We'd like to have some higher level laws, just the same way that you know, we can say that uh, right, uh, times distributes over plus. And, and, and you can say that sort of once and for all without you know, doing the quote equation of reading of actually multiplying the numbers. And, uh, and so in order to start talking about this, they introduce uh, some category theoretic concepts, which we want to do in the full general. And they, 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 they do introduce these sorts of pattern functors. Um, and and there's going to be talk about those tomorrow. Uh, how many people sort of recognize what's going on with these few lines here? Uh, how many people do not recognize that? Okay, so we're going to have to go over this at least a little and talk about what's going on. Um, and the general notion is that, that there's a large class of right, potentially infinite data structures or recursive structures like lists and so forth. And what, we've got, and what we can do with them is we can talk about everything about them, just one step at a time. Uh, so many people are hopefully familiar with uh, the theorem that fold R, or well, not just fold R, that various folds can be thought of as the quote, universal property of a list, which is to say, uh, oh, here. Uh, uh, um, pick it up. Okay. That's the type signature fold R, right? And so, um, if you sort of swap the arguments of that round so that you put the list argument first, uh, you're going to say fold R uh, with the swapped arguments is going to be a function that, given the list of A's, now is a function that takes a list of A to B to B, or no, uh, sorry, a function of A to B to B, and the value of B, and returns to a B. And it, it is a theorem that we're going to get to that um, every, if, if I have a list and then I partially apply fold R to that list, that what I have left is equivalent to the original list in every respect. I have neither gained nor lost any information um, through doing this. And the way to see it, which we're going to get to, that's, uh, uh, is if you put in cons as your uh, A to B to B, and the empty list as your B, then the fold will you know, give you back either the list or the reverse list or whatever, depending on what order the fold runs. But something that you can see is clearly the same as the list they started with. Um, and, and you can go in the other direction. Um, and so what these pattern functors are is a very general purpose way of taking many recursive structures and breaking them down into these step-by-step -step pieces that capture uh, what's going on. So for the list, but we'll start for the nat functor, right? When we talk naturals here where it's like I have, uh, uh, let's not do the math, let's do the list. It's more interesting and actually easier to grasp in a way. Um, and it's the only one we're really going to talk about. Even though they do their stuff in full generality, here we're really just going to talk about lists because uh, there's enough interesting with them. And when you're talking about lists, you're talking about streams of operations on data, and so therefore uh, you're talking about online streaming algorithms of all sorts, which is basically what the modern internet is built on. Right? Things where you've got a fire hose of data coming at you, and you don't want your structures to build up bigger and bigger over time. You can't wait till it's all done. You incrementally need to keep producing as much as you can if you're going to keep up. And, and, and those are all list algorithms, so, so it's okay that we uh, focus on lists, even though when you do it in the generality, you, you can work on many other recursive structures as well. So here we go. We say that the pattern functor, or the, or the signature uh, functor, or, or just call it the signature data structure, forget the word functor, of list is this. It's either nil or cons of an A and an R. And the, the A, so we're going to have a list of A's, and so we just have that A there, right? And you can just substitute that in for int w or now if you want. Think of nearly what it gets. So we have nil, and then it's cons of an int 
to some R, and that, that R can be anything, and I put R for remainder there, right? And so that's not a recursive structure, clearly. Right? Um, it's either, you know, the unit, or it's just a pair of things. So, so, so it, you know, and in fact, you could just call it either unit pair. And then, but, but the important thing about either unit pair is if you keep putting these either unit pairs one after the other after the other, um, um, right, so if I have um, cons of f of, say, uh, 1, um, and then cons f. Uh, other things I'm bad at are writing on the chalkboard, so I apologize. 2, uh, 3, blah, blah, blah. Right now, that's the list. And then somewhere around at the end, I'm going to have a nil. Right? So, so I've written a list. Now, what's the type of that list? Well, that, now it's going to, that list is going to be a list f of int of, of list f of int of list f of int of list f of int. So it, it's going to reflect every single one of these constructors as we go down. And uh, this fixed point of the functor guy is a way of sort of collapsing that down and saying it's an arbitrary nesting of this that can go infinitely deep or, you know, cut off at any point. And it's just a way of, right, now, uh, now, now here's the, but we, we, they don't, and we don't really need to get to that fixed point stuff. To, it's just a way to think about what's going on here is that recursive structures are built of one step of, of a constructor plus another step of a constructor. Um, now, now the important thing is we have an isomorphism. Here I've, I've written L algebra for what we're going to call a list algebra. And in this formulation, a list algebra it's just going to be our two arguments to fold R. It's going to be our function A to B to B, which we call a, quote, cons function, right? If you think of a fold, one way to think of a fold on a list is I write out the list, and it's, you know, one colon two colon three colon four colon empty list. And the fold just replaces everywhere you see a colon with a function, and it replaces the empty list with the sort of unit value of the fold. So you can think of it as a syntactic substitution, right? In, uh, or an interpretation of an algebra. If you think of cons as an algebraic operation, Right, um, you can think of it as I've written a formula and now I fix the meaning of my cons operator to be a particular interpretation um, of what it means to adjoin something about yourself. Right, and that could be summing. So now, um, we're, we're only going to look at one step of a fold at a time. So we have the list algebra, and that's the two arguments that we're going to pass to a, uh, 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 to a fold. Right, so, you, um, so given a list and a list algebra, clearly I can produce the result of the fold. Now we're going to write a one-step fold, and that's just like a list algebra, and not a normal Haskell list, but just one step of this either unit or pair. And it's just going to, in the first case, right, if you give me a nil, I'll give you the B, the, the unit value. And if you give me a um, cons, I'll apply my operation to the pair, right? So you can say, this is sort of the universal way to get something out of, this is the eliminator, just like, you know, maybe we have the eliminator for maybe or the eliminator for either. This is just the eliminator for that list F structure. It's the guy that I give you a list F, and then I tell you what to do in the nil case, and I tell you what to do in the cons case. And now I've, in a sense, told you everything that you can know about this very simple structure. And, and so everything you can do to one of these list Fs is going to be captured in a, um, in a list algebra. And that's a lot simpler to see because we're not looking at the recursive structure deeply nested. It's just, there's not many things you can do with unit and pair. And um, so therefore, this captures all of them, what you do in the unit case and what you do in the pair case. So where you had a pair of functions, well, sorry, a pair of constructors, the unit constructor and the pair constructor, we now have in the algebra the dual of that, a pair of functions, right, one per constructor. And now, this fold takes us in one direction, right? It takes us from a list algebra to, now you can put parentheses, right? It takes you from list algebra to this guy. Right, and, and very often, when you'll see something in these textbooks, and that's why I'm going through this, where they'll write capital F of uh, A arrow A, and they'll say that's a list algebra. And, then, and this, what I'm illustrating is that's the same isomorphism here. If we take our list f to be what they'll denote as a capital F, then you have an isomorphism where I can take a list algebra, and it's equivalent to any function, right? any old function that you can possibly write from list f of ar, uh, uh, or in this case, ab to b. 
And we can write the isomorphism in the other direction with make list algebra right there, where um, if I'm given um, you know one of these fun uh, something that one of these functions that maps out of a list algebra, um, I uh, sort of can just wrap up its partial applications right into my tuple and, and recover my dictionary. And so this is a very important isomorphism here because you can see sort of code as data and data as code, right? This LALG guy here we got there, that's a pair of functions, so you can think of them as the data structure. The other guy we've got, list F A, B, arrow B, that's just a pure function. And what we have is now a very simple theorem that this, that this pure function can be represented as a, as a pair of other things. And that you can go back and forth freely between them. And you can say, why am I going through all this? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going slowly enough, it's going to take you two, two hours. I, I've barely gotten started. But um, we're going through all this because all of these identities that look very trivial, it turns out that if you, that you can, you only need a couple of non-trivial ones among them for a whole equational structure to emerge. And uh, that's what's going to happen. Now, uh, I don't know, I don't want to stop for exercise, but, uh, uh, do, do people feel that they'd like to take a, like a minute and try to convince themselves that we've written an isomorphism with the step and make this algebra, or do they feel that this is okay? Sure. All right. Um, so now here we observe that our pattern functor is indeed a functor in the Pascal sense that, you know, if I have a list step of, you know, that has one thing in the remainder position and something else in the remainder position, I, I can map the two. Um, and here uh, we've shown what I talked about earlier that, you know, I, 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 can, I can apply the arguments from a list algebra uh, as arguments to a fold R and, and recover my normal fold on lists. And this guy we call little a is precisely the guy that if I take, you know, this fold of my little a algebra, I recover the list right back. So, so this shows sort of why fold R is a universal in that sense. Um, so yeah, this is a simple enough exercise that uh, uh, I, I've shown you how to write the function that gives you back the list a, a, as a pair of functions. Uh, can you do that for sum and length? If you know how to do it, look at your neighbor if you, and see if your neighbor knows how to do it. And if they don't, talk to them about it. And take about a minute to do this. And if you're, if you're convinced that you think that you guys know how to do it, uh, then raise your hands and tell me to keep going. I have a stupid question. How do I construct a, a list f that I can use to test this? It, it, it's just a function, right? or it's just a pair, right? It's a type. So uh, I'll give away the answer now to one of these. Or if anyone wants to jump in and uh, sort of like teach this patent and tell me the answer, what is the pair algebra for some? Oh. Plus, you want to tell me what that is? Plus and zero. Plus and middle. Pardon? Plus and middle. Yes. There we go. Um, so uh, Doug has explained that this is the sum pair algebra, right? So right. we say that before the empty list, you, you return a zero, and if you were going to con something on, you substitute that with a plus. Uh, and length pair algebra is going to be something like lambda x y uh, probably y plus one. Uh, Right? So it's going to throw away one argument, but every time you see it, you cons on, you just add one. And that's sort of what a length pair algebra is going to look like. So now, uh, 
Yes. Now we get to the parts that immediately get fairly tricky, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to present some things that, in a sense, you're either going to have to believe or we're going to have to chase the category diagrams. And I was planning on just asking you to trust me. Um, because uh, now what we can do with this is, but I needed to introduce what, uh, uh, what, what these list holds and these pattern functors were. Because now we have a non-trivial theory, <coughs> which is another way of uh, stating the universal property that holds. Which, and, and when you have these universal property statements here, what we're saying is, if we have some function h that can be written as the fold of some pattern functor f, right? So I've got some, some, some pair algebra. I've got some function h, like I can write sum any way I want, but if it so happens that I, I, but I know that sum can be written as fold of that sum pair algebra. So if any function, any way of writing the function sum that is equivalent to writing fold of some pair algebra. Now, that is the same thing, and this is a non-trivial theorem, as saying that if I apply h to folding that, enti that entirely boring, just the one step list fold, to folding that entirely boring thing we saw where it's just cons and, you know, nil. Then that's equal, at, then that is equal to list folding, right, which is that one step fold, um, the, pair, the, the algebra, and then mapping over H. And, and that's a really non-trivial strange property. And um, the best way to see it, and, you know, if we're going to go at the proper pace, you're not going to have a lot of time to play with this, but you can take this code and paste this into your REPL or something, <laughs> and just start typing it out and playing with it, and, and trying to call these functions, uh, and see what happens, right? So we've... Gershon, is, is that little a found in the theorem? Well, that little a is, is up here. I've given it right here. Right? Oh, it's, your, it's your trivial algebra. I'm just using the rotation to convert. Um, so we've already, LFA is the list fold of A, and it takes a list F, where it's cons of an element to now just, you know, a normal Haskell list, right? And so you can say view that as one step of a fold reduction of a list. And what we're saying is the universal, and now we've given the universal property by writing both sides of this equality below, the h dot list fold a and the uh, uh, list fold f dot map h. And this is just showing that they have the same type signature, right? And in both cases, it's something that takes a list of a's to a b and a list algebra and then it takes um, the list functor, which is sort of your one-step deconstruction of your list of A's, into the first A cons the rest of them, and takes that to a B. Um, and here we've just verified that these two things that don't even necessarily look like they have the same type signature, right? in fact, at least have the same type signature. And then if you work through the um, symbols, you, you'll find that they, in fact, uh, are equivalent in terms of the operations they perform. Um, <coughs> And one way to verify this here is we've said that H is equivalent to the fold of an F, right? So now we're going to substitute in from UP1, we look at UP3, we just substitute an H um, for fold F, just to look at what happens. And um, then it becomes much more obvious why it's an identity, because you can trace things to it. So, so this is something that you, know, you might want to work through a bit and convince yourself of. Uh, and it's something that either is mysterious or trivial once you, uh, you know, grasp it or not. Um, and the beauty of this is, uh, yeah, and here, full day is ID, we're not going through that, is when you write this as a diagram, um, where, and I, I'm not going to do a community square on the chalkboard and tempt it, but um, we can maybe do it later if people really want. You can now extend that diagram, and you can apply that identity, and then say, but now, what if I don't just have um, something like up here, where I just have uh, you know, h dot list fold a, but instead I introduce a third guy, a g. And if I have an um, and now I can sort of take that identity and sort of apply it to my knowledge of what happens when I introduce a third guy, and I get an incredibly non-trivial theorem, which is at the heart of these program transformations, which is fold fusion. And the claim is if I have any function h, and I, you know, sort of take this one step um, out of the pattern functor transition on it, on an F. And then if I can produce some, if I have some other G, that sort of is, other, is the other way, where I map the H over everything first, and then I take the one step transition with the G, then those are the same. That, that's my precondition, that I've set up this sort of non-trivial sort of commutative identity between a G and an H. Now, I get the property that H dot fold F equals fold G. 
So you can apply this in both directions. And sometimes it's the case. I have the fold of a single function g. But I know that I can do other stuff if I pull some of the work out of the fold, right? And so now I can take my fold of g, I can demonstrate this equational identity, and then and figure out what that fold of h, what the h must be that I can pull out of it, and the f, which is the remainder. So I can split a fold. And um, going the other way, I can fuse two things if I, you know, want to sort of do the work as I go. Um, <laughs> I, I guess that it, it's hard to tell if I'm moving too fast or too slow for uh, <laughs> our, our supporting friends. Um, and here we've written um, the uh, to uh, 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 just again just to verify that this claim, which I took from you know the book, and it, they wrote it uh, with symbolic notation, and I, I didn't know if I could make sense of it. So what I did, and this is what I want to hope I can illustrate, is I turned it into code so that you can type check it. Right? And <laughs> therefore, um, I, I, you know, we wrote the two sides of it here. And you'll note that uh, I, I pulled a trick that I want to show people here that just you can learn from in terms of how you play with this stuff on the REPL. Is in both cases, I claim I have some ambient H, F, and G in the environment. But I don't know what, how do I even, you know, so, so what I do is I just write my functions F, F, 1, and F, F, 2. And they take these ambient guys in the, uh, right, as arguments. Now, if you actually take type of FF1, let me, uh, right, we see a problem, right? That there's a free type variable t. Because we haven't, we've taken an argument, but we're not using it in this function, we're only using it in the other. And then similarly, type of FF2 for full fusion 2. You know, the other guy's free. So, so, so now, like, now it's very hard to read. I can't just ask GHCI what's the type and have it guide my intuition. But we can use this trick here, type of FFY as type of FF2. And now that's going to force those two signatures to unify. <laughs> um, and as type of has been in the prelude for forever, and, and it's for precisely such purposes. So, so now I, I've asked GHCI to do the unification and I can see what it must be all together. And then I can sort of substitute in better variable names if I like. And that's what I've shown it to get down here. And so we've, now we observe that it's a function that takes a B to a C and then two list algebras and then uh, a list of A to B and gives you back a C. So, so you in fact do see the fusion that it sort of takes your list F of A to B and gives you back C by somehow fusing these two different list algebras together. You have two equivalent ways of doing so that are computationally now not doing the same work anymore. Right? They computationally might take different amounts of time. Um, so here's a, um, this is sort of a stupid one. Um, but it shows the principle. It's nothing you'd actually want to do in practice. It's a slightly non-trivial exercise. So if people want to work through this, uh, it, it, it's actually a real exercise, uh, which is look at this law that I've given you right here. Take h to be shell, f to be sum, and write the, write the g, write the unique function g such that um, you know, it obeys this law. right? So show dot sum of a list has to be, can be written, I claim, purely as the fold over a list in one pass. Uh, it, it's a really inefficient thing. Um, so it's purely for demonstration purposes. But you can imagine going the other way. What if you've accidentally written a fold over a list where at every step, because it's coming from some dynamically thing, you're sort of reading and showing the input and you know, back and forth. Then, and, and you know, I, I haven't done that in Haskell. I've certainly done that in the dynamic language where you accidentally right, sort of keep passing it through a JSON dictionary or something. You can now apply this theorem and you know, therefore say, well, I can Fuse, I can unfuse and split out that two JSON set to the end and sort of work in my nice numerical thing. Um, and, and, and that's an application of this theorem. Now, of course, one doesn't necessarily say, in order to do this, I'm going to demonstrate this fold fusion precondition. And, right? so, so just, but, but, that, but that's the case always. You, you learn the equational rules, and then, and then you apply them intuitively as well as equationally. Um, so I, I don't know if I'm going to make people walk through the exercise, but I wanted to demonstrate that. And then here we have the sum algorithm we just discussed. 
and uh, and then this this gives you the parameters for the exercise if you want to do it now or later as you would, uh, you just have to write what this undefined is here and, and then produce what that would be and you can see what it must be is something that reads uh, in your integer then does operation on it and then shows it back out again um, Uh, and now here's some trivial uh, identities that are actually rather complicated to work through operationally. So I don't know, again, like, it's very hard for me to gauge with the audience if you just want to keep talking or if you want to try to, you know, actually determine that these identities are in fact the identity. And, and you can prove them with the fold laws I've given you. So, so um, you can substitute mechanically and that would take forever. Or you can apply the fold fusion law and prove them. You know, maybe uh, people want to maybe just pop it open the REPL enough to get the type signature of those two things to determine for yourself that those types are equivalent to the type of the identity function of these. Uh, that, that might be worth doing. But again, th these things seem trivial. Um, <laughs> but then you, you start to put them together and you'd be surprised. When you read the bird um, routines book, they don't have a function make list of, but they, they always represent things of f of a or a. Um, so it, it, the notation here is a bit clumsy. Are these available somewhere? This is all in the GitHub repository. Uh, so, sorry if that wasn't clear. It's, uh, it's in the exercise materials. You go to the Lambda Conf, you will see bases. Right. List F is one step of unfolding recursion. So list F, it, 
um, right? It's list at a r, so it's a list up of n. It's just a pair, it's either nothing or it's a pair of an int and some remainder that we don't know what it is. Right, so in uh, ex1, it's less than integer, integer. Right. So that's, that's a one step where the step is integer and the tail is integer? Yeah. So I'm a little confused about what that actually means. Uh, it's something that takes two integers and the U.S. That's it. You're adding two numbers. It's one step of reduction. So it's more helpful to think about it in terms of pairs instead of cons. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and then the whole point of this, in a way, is that you can take things that you normally would have to think of whole meal in terms of all your cons is, and think of it just pairwise. Because at each step, you only have to, to you available, right, those two arguments to your combiner function, right? <coughs> challenge is, is you need to write a function that, given a pair of an integer and a string, gives you back a string. And, and that string should be the result of adding the integer and the integer represented by the string. So you can see that you, know, you, you add the first one to the read of the second, and then you show the remainder of it. And uh, that, that sort of, and then what you can observe is doing, is going through that sort of excess sequence of reads and shows so it can be fused away uh, to this other operation. Um, all right, I, so now we're actually going to get to uh, another non-trivial theorem. Uh, in the case of list, it's very obvious, and many of us have uh, done this accidentally in the past, or what, you know, certainly without as much uh, to do as, as, it, as we're going to go through here. Right, but, but you know, it, 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 the banana split theorem is a generalization of the statement that if I have, a, um, if I have two folds um, that produce a pair of results, they may always be written as a single fold, right? And the famous example of this is, right, if I want to take the, uh, the mean of a list, right, I have to have one fold to take the sum and another fold to take the length, and I take the sum over the length. But I can write that, in fact, in one pass. Uh, so, so everyone here can imagine sort of how one might write that in one pass, right? And, uh, probably most of these have done this at some point. Uh, OK, good. So right, now, now it's universally true. You can do this for any two things, not just sum and length. And the only part that makes the banana split theorem interesting, which is not what we're going to do here, is you can do it not over just a list functor, but any of these pattern functors. So you can do it over trees or anything else that you like. As long as you have two traversals, you can always uh, put them together. Now, the interesting part about it, outside of you know, the, the fact, is that it's a, our first example of true program calculation. It's something that can be proved entirely using identities and using the laws we've given. And that's what uh, I'm showing you here, is I have many functions, right, bs1 through 6. They are all of the same type signature. They take two list algebras, and they take a list f of a and then list of a, right, which is recall as isomorphic for list of a. And they give you back a pair of b and c. So there are many functions that give you two ways to go from a list of a's to a pair of b and c. And all of these functions not only have the same type signature, but um, I claim that they are the exact same function. They do the exact same thing. And, and furthermore, be any two, between any two of their fu these functions, there is a single application of a single law, or in some cases two applications of the same law, that lets you observe equationally that these two functions must be the same. Right? And that's what it means for it to be program calculation. So in this case, we start off with the naive thing which is full, uh, right, and, and, and is uh, imported from uh, control that uh, Right, that now, now if you substitute the a there, that's the arrow, for just the function arrow, because we're only using it in that limited context. And, and, and is something that takes uh, b arrow c and a b arrow c prime, and it returns a function b arrow c comma c prime. 
So it's just like, it, it's a way of, of forking off one argument into two uh, functions and then returning the pair of those results. And so um, here, this is the most naive way that you would do this. You just apply one fold and the other fold and fork them both off from the same uh, list fold. Here is a slightly uh, less naive way for, to do it, uh, or, which is a result of uh, a mechanical law that we call split fusion, right? Which is, and uh, you can see exactly what it does. If I do one function, so if I apply one function to something and then fork it off, right? These are all written point free on them, right? So that, and they like to do it point free so that you can, these laws look more equational. So here I've got a pipeline of operations. The second pipe, pipeline is, operation of the pipeline is these, this pair of folds. And the first operation is a single list fold, right? Now, we say, well, I can distribute the list fold back into this sort of splitting off, right? If I need to do it to the argument once, and then I can split off the result into two different places, well, why don't I just send the argument to both places, and now I'm going to do the same work twice by splitting off that thing into both pairs. And that's what we do. So it doesn't look like it's a simplification, but uh, it lets us now take us somewhere else. By the uh, properties of fold, uh, right, the fold of C1 is um, dot the list fold of A is equivalent to the list fold of C1 dot the list map of the fold of C1. And you're going to say what? And now I'll, I'll, we, we introduced it up uh, somewhere up here as a, sort of an equational property. It's just sort of the universal property of fold. Um, so I'm bouncing around, right? It's this guy right here. We're just applying that identity. Now, um, again, it, 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 it looks unnatural that you would want to apply that identity. And in a sense, that's the difficulty with this stuff is the reason you know to apply that identity is because you're Richard Burke. I can't give you better answer. But, um, but it, it's also one of the only ones you've got lying around, so you might as well try to apply it. So, um, knowing which law to apply is one thing, but I guess I'm still not seeing, like, what, what's our goal here with these transformations? Like, what should we be trying to reach? Well, 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 let's walk through this one and we'll see. Okay. Okay. Um, because, right, again, this is a very nice proof, and then the difficulty is, it, 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 from learning these, you learn techniques. But you don't learn how to come up with it as precisely as a nice proof of this. Because you just have to see a lot of examples, just like of a lot of you know, proofs by induction or something. After a while, you get the hang of the, thing, the steps you want to have. So we're just going to walk through one. We're not going to talk about how to do it in general, because I, I can't do that either. Um, we're going to talk about the ones that are nice that someone else who knows what they really came up with. Um, so here we go. By the universal property of fold, we can apply that transformation. Now, you can apply something called split expansion. And here what we've done is right, we've introduced, you can always sort of, you know, add whatever you want over here. If, you, if you're splitting something into a pair of results, you can always apply whatever function you want on this side, as long as you then throw it away. So, right, so this guy was the list map of the fold of C1, right, in the first half. And so now, he can be the list map of the fold of C1 and anything else over here, it doesn't matter, because we're just going to take the first of the result. So right, you can just expand out whatever nonsense you want there, because you're going to throw it away by calling first on. And here we do the same thing, except you're going to throw it away by calling second on it, and you expand out on the other side. But now what we've done is we've right, introduced this parallelism. We're here we're folding a C1, and here we're folding a C2. We've arranged things so that they're now in the same form. And now we're folding C1 and folding C2 in both cases again. Yeah? Is it fair to say that we're um, sort of uh, slowly and laboriously commuting fold from the end of this pipeline and forward to the beginning of the pipeline? Uh, that's probably true. That, that's a good way to think of it, is that uh, that's a way to think of the goal in a way, is you just like, you know, a, a goal you learn in, in, you know, algebra is get all the x's on the same side. Yeah. And whatever you're doing, it, it should eventually get them there. Maybe one has to come back over to push it back over, but you sort of, I think, yeah, in this case, the goal is that we sort of, is exactly that we want to pull this fold out of the uh, pairing operation. And, and, and you want to just arrange everything so that they're in a position where you can do so. Um, so now we apply uh, functor splitting, right? Where you have the property that map f dot map g equals map f dot g, right? And normally we use that to fuse maps. But in this case, we've got a map f dot g. And for algebraic reasons, we're going to go in the opposite direction and have the map f and the map g separately. And in this case, you can see why we want to do it. Because here we're mapping first dot that, and here we're mapping second dot that. 
So they're not the same function. But if you split the maps in two, then this function right, is exactly the same function as this guy. So we've rearranged it to share as more work again by, by getting the parallel structure on both sides of the tuple. And now we apply uh, backwards split fusion. And you get to this guy that looks uh, pretty awkward, where we fold the c1.map first and the fold the c2.map second. And that entire structure is composed with mapping the fold of c1 and c2. Now, this is not any more efficient than we started. But it's an interesting form. Because the form is we take this entire thing to be one of these guys we would call H. And so you have this, H dot map that. And then you apply the universal property of lists because you have function dot a map. And that tells you that, that, that there must, that you can actually produce a result. It's, in fact, it's not constructed. It doesn't tell you what the result must be. But it tells you if you have a function dot a map, you can write the entire thing as a fold. And, and that is indeed what we then do. Um, and um, now, now here we've gone through and determined what that fold must be in this case. Um, and, and, and this is what we started with, is just the fold of one and the fold of the other. And this is the result. So we fold, make list algebra fold of one dot list map first and fold uh, and uh, the C2 uh, list map second. And, uh, and there you go, that, that is a fully uh, mechanical proof. And I, I, I hope you've seen sort of the point here is that it's sort of a laborious process, but you know one, I mean, you need a flash of insight to write the proof, but you don't need to make an ad hoc heuristic argument as to why these two things are the same. You know by equational laws that these two things must necessarily be the same. And in case of algorithm like this, it's easy to see examining the algorithm why it does the same thing. When you get to more complicated algorithms, it's no longer obvious that this algorithm should work, that they look like magic. And one way to make them look not like magic is to start with an algorithm that you know <coughs> must be true because it's, it, it reads just like the specification. And then you apply a series of steps to get to something that looks like it couldn't possibly be true, and then you know it must be, be, be because these steps each make sense, and, and it's the way we approach the, the, the salt in the parts. Um, so quick question, can, can anyone uh, tell me the obvious way uh, to fuse two folds, just off the top of their head, right? Uh, in, in general, if I give you two algebras, uh, well, what's the way to write a two-list algebra in our explicit pair representation? <coughs> How would I just write like the single list algebra that's a fusion of both of them? Well, remember, a list algebra has two components. It's got two nils, and it's got uh, well, well, now we have two nils. A list algebra has a nil and a function. It's got a b and an a to b to b. Now I've got a pair of them, a to b to b, b, b and another one, and then I've got two nils. How do I smush them together if I'm just writing this without thinking about any of the stuff I've just shown you? What, what would the function be? Uh, I'll give you the hint. Yeah, your nil. Just Yeah, exactly. Your nil needs to be a pair of the two nils. And then, you know, you, you, every time you, you get an argument, you, you, you take the first of the argument and you apply your first function to it, your second of the argument, you apply your second function to it. So you just turn, your, turn it into a carrier of pairs all the way through. Which again, you can think, right, there's a very nice, and this is the sort of thing where once you draw the category diagrams, it must be the case, right? It's sort of like it commutes, right? That you can come up with these nice category slogans like, uh, the product of folds is the fold of thoughts, in this case, right? And in a sense, category theory and natural transformations is about coming up with slogans like that. <laughs> where you swap, no, which is true, you swap two words and you show that this operation sort of the, the product or the either or whatever it is carries across it. Um, and, and, and that's the slogan here in the category theoretic standpoint. Um, so, so that's a non-trivial theorem. Uh, now, now we're going to do maximum sentence song. Oh boy, uh, this took me a long time to walk through. Um, and, uh, it's a fun one. Uh, there's about six papers I give them in the site that, that examine this one. Everyone likes to examine it. Uh, some people have written more than one paper on it because it's such a nice little problem. Um, so, uh, and uh, I'll tell you a story uh, without going into too much detail. Uh, there was a problem at a job I had 
where uh, we spent a long time trying to come up with uh, a very efficient algorithm for it. And, and, and we figured out how to write it in one pass, but not, not uh, monoidally. And months later, I realized that the, algorithm, the problem we had was a variant of maximum segment sum. And if I had known that, I would have known why writing it monoidally wouldn't have made sense. Um, and also, you know, rather than having to think about the algo, which we did figure out, uh, I would have known how to write the algo from the textbook. So, so it, it's a problem that actually occurs in practice in a lot of applications in various ways. And where at least I didn't know the efficient algo for it had, was a textbook algo for a long time. Um, so the first thing here is uh, I've written concat list instead of just concat in case you happen to be on GSC 6 and your general has concat signature. Um, so, oh, 7, 10, pardon me. Um, oh, we're doing a lot of, uh, of, of run-up, that's right. We're not going to hit maximum segments, so by the way. I, I think I underestimated that. I'm only a, uh, <laughs> but that's OK. Uh, I'll just speed a bit faster and lose you a bit faster. Um, <laughs> concat list is a natural transformation, um, right? So uh, map a function over concat list. Right, if I'm mapping something over the concatenation of a bunch of lists, I can map the mapping over the lists and then concatenate later. So I can push these things back and forth. Uh, we're introducing now list homomorphisms. A list homomorphism <coughs> is a function h from list of a to a, or some particular a, um, such that you have this marvelous property here. Either this or that, where, which is to say that I can sort of divide up my list arbitrarily into ma as many sublists as I feel like. And then I can apply my list homomorphism to all those sublists. And then I can apply my list homomorphism to all the resultant list. And that's the same as if I just uh, applied the list homomorphism to the concatenation of all the lists. So it's something that you can sort of split as you desire. And it always gives you the same thing. And a sum is, again, a, a classical example of this, right? But, but there are much more interesting list homomorphisms as well. And then they come up in uh, many realms and write um, all the stuff with MapReduce of results from studying these. So people talk about monoids a lot, right? And MapReduce and, and all your Scala libraries. Uh, the study of them actually started with list homomorphisms. Because you talk about monoids as the character functions for list homomorphisms. Um, and in fact, uh, map and reduce come from a fundamental law of list homomorphisms um, here. We define our monoidal operation, the carrier uh, uh, of this, as just if I give, you only give me you know, a list of x's comma y's, and I apply the list homomorphism to this pair, right? that gives me a pairwise operation. And that pairwise operation is going to be the model. And now I have a theorem. If I have such a pairwise operation defined in that way, then I can take my list homomorphism and I can split it into a map component, which takes every element and applies the list homomorphism to the single element of the list. And then, uh, this is a fold R, but it can be really any sort of fold, including a parallel fold. Then I fold the combination of combining these with my monoid hom homomorphism, or my monoid operation, over, over that list of injected things. So this is a splitting of a list homomorphism <coughs> into two phases, a map phase and a fold phase. And this says that list homomorphisms can be solved by map reduce. And, and this is the theorem uh, which gave rise to all the ideas of map reduce. So uh, that's sort of neat. And, and, and you'll note that the, the thing about map reduce is it, it doesn't tell you how to solve interesting problems. It tells you how to solve obvious problems. <laughs> It'll, and what the interesting part, which I will not fully get to here, is how do I take things that do not appear to be list homomorphisms? and turn them into list homomorphisms? How do I take al algorithms that, that appear to be innately sequential and turn them into algorithms that in fact do have a parallel component that was hiding? And we use all of our tricks here to manipulate them to expose that latent parallelism. And uh, I don't think I'm going to get to that. that, that the parallel prefix sum example I have is at the end. And that gives a version of that. Uh, but at, at a minimum, we're going to do maximum segment sum first. Um, so now, uh, that, that's sort of one thing we need to even understand MSS. Um, and uh, the, so if you look at that about monoid, uh, you, you'll find many uh, list homomorphisms there, right? Because all monoids induce a list homomorphism and vice versa. Uh, now, uh, 
we're going to talk about uh, an interesting fusion property. Um, and, and we're actually going to, uh, are we going to prove it? I don't know. We're going to talk about it and, and semi-prove it. Um, and uh, so we're going to find a function called Pale's algebra. And it, it's a pair algebra like the others. And this pair algebra is going to be the fold that yields the function tails. You all know what the function tails does in Haskell? It's uh, Sonic the Hedgehog's little pal. Right? Uh, sorry. Right? There we go. That's, that, that's tails, right? It, it gives me all the tails of a list. And uh, we also have the nits. These are interesting, right? These are interesting functions. And we're going to give you some theorems about it. Uh, so tails algebra is a fold that, that produces that. Uh, for the unit, we give you back the list with only the zero element. Or, or in this case, with the one element, we give you back that. We, the unit is uh, the empty list. And then for each additional step, we cons one more guy onto, onto the guy that we had, our running sum, right? So this is our running, and so we sort of build up from the back at each step. We, we see one more guy. We have the guy we had before, which is our list of like the last four things. And then we see the, the, the third thing in, and then we uh, cons him on, but then we also preserve everything we had before. And so you can write this as single pass fold. Uh, uh, now we have our function scan run. Why, why did you do uh, two in the where clause? Um, why are there two steps in the where clause instead of? Uh, like, uh, why do I have this guy and not just the other? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're right. There's two clauses. There's of y on the right. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, do we know what a scan is? Uh, let's, let's, again, we'll just uh, be... Right, there we go. Right, that's a scan. Um, so I've taken the list one through five, and then I, I've, I've built up, in this case, a scan from the right coming back that is going to sort of give me uh, my songs. And we, we can do a scan out, and it should look much more familiar. Right? That's a scan. So it's sort of the triangular numbers there, right? I've got zero, and then one, and then one plus two, then one plus two plus three, then one plus two plus three plus four, and so forth, right? Um, and, um, uh, and, and so the claim is tails is initial with regards to rightward scans. And, and this is just an exercise in using the word initial, right? Is if I have a list, and then I apply tails to that list, then um, I map some function over the result. Then that can give me any sort of result that I would get from applying a scan function. So tails plus map gives right, and then that's what you can think of is a scan, in a sense, is I built up you know, the first and the first, the second, first, second, third, and then in each of those cases I'm going to crunch down that list. Now it so happens I can do it more efficiently by sort of sharing work incrementally, but algebraically, I can think of tails as a combination of, uh, oh, sorry, of scans as a combination of tails and um, maps. And, and that's the theorem right there. And uh, we use our fusion law to prove it. Right? We take our fusion law and we just substitute in map of the fold of the algebra for our H, tails algebra for the F, and scan right for the G. And uh, we observe that these two functions, which are preconditions, are equal, and that's easy because they're not particularly recursive, right? They don't, uh, not especially so. And uh, by fusion, then we can observe that scan right of an algebra equals map the fold of the algebra about the tails of the algebra. And so that's a full proof, if you walk it through, of uh, what we call uh, tails fusion. And we do the exact same thing again, but I'm not going to walk you through, uh, with the next. In this case, no, we've written a really inefficient init because here we're actually mapping x to each time. And that's because we're writing inits in terms of a right fold, which would be really good in terms of a left fold. But I'm just doing this for, uh, because in, in, in the program derivations, we pass through this, but we don't use it directly for one. And, and for another thing, I didn't want to have to make sure that's a fold So um, we make the same argument again, and we observe that we have inits fusion, uh, which gives us the same law. Scan left of some function in the empty element, 
is mapped to the fold of the function in the empty development as applied to an x. Um, and, and so these are powerful new tools. And you can see that we had only took that one fold fusion law, and all these others are derived consequences of it, right? This is a nice thing about an axiomatic system. You have, you know, a few axioms and many theorems, uh, many of which seem surprising. Uh, now, now let's describe maximum segment sum. Uh, we've done all the pre preliminaries. Uh, here's some test data. It's a sequence of integers. Uh, it doesn't have to be integers. Uh, for maximum segment sum, it does need to be things that you can add in some having doubles, whatever you want. You can generalize more. But then they need to have both an operation that gives you a notion of a maximum, you need to have good ordering properties, and they need to have you know, some sort of addition with regards to that. So you can vector this sort of stuff as well. Um, but you need to have the right properties. So you need to have the right metric on it or something. Um, now we define a function segments, which is concat.mapamentnits.tails. <laughs> Now, 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 you could see this produces a lot of segments, right? Uh, <coughs> there, those are all the segments of one to five, right? I got one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, two, two, three, two, three, four, two, three, four, five. Right, right? So this is every possible sort of contiguous subsequence of a list. Um, and uh, right, and so so that, that that's a lot more lists than we started with, right? Um, a lot more list elements, and it's, it's, it's O and cubed in that. Um, and, and that's the most obvious way to write segments, is it's, uh, you know, you, you take all the tails, you take all the ends, and you take all the emits of all the tails, and then, and then between that you must cover every possible subsequence uh, uniquely. Uh, maximum segment sum is this problem. We're going to take all the segments, we're going to sum them up, then we're going to take the maximum among all of those. And that's going to be, give it, I give you a list, and I say, pick any subsequence of the list, and tell me the one subsequence that gives you the highest possible number. And then that's the sort of question you might really want to take if you're doing this screening data analysis out here. Um, now, the interesting thing about this, right, is of course, these lists must contain negative as well as positive numbers, right? What would happen if the list was all positive numbers? Uh, what's the algorithm for maximum segment sum? Sum, yes, it's, I, uh, it's sum. I, I, it's a very good algorithm. Uh, so, so you have to have negative numbers as well, so that it could be that if I go here and then it goes negative, it goes so negative, right, that it, it wipes out all the good work I've done here building up, and I should just start over from scratch again and, and look at the segment that lives between two negatives. Um, and that's why I've given you this test data with like minus 100, minus 1,000 and stuff. So, it, so that we can be sure it's not, you know, not just more than degenerate problems. Um, so we're going to go through the same exercises with the banana split theorem, except uh, using a bunch of different rules, um, and including the rules we just introduced. Right. So, so you believe me that first off that this is, this is a very good specification of a problem, right? If I tell you this is maximum segment sum, you believe me, right? I mean, you, you can run it a few times and quick check it to test it, but this is. This is sort of what you want to start with. And what we're going to do is we're going to take it to the efficient algorithm um, through mechanical steps, all of which are necessarily true. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is just inline the definition of segments, right? That, that's the equation we're using we're used to. Right? That's very simple. Then we're going to apply this naturality of concat that we started with. So we have map sum dot concat, and we're going to replace this with concat of map of map of sum, right? Now, that of course must work. We've said that we've introduced list homomorphisms in the laws, right? Just like sum is a list homomorphism, maximum is a list homomorphism. So we apply that function so that instead of maximum dot concat list dot map dot map sum, we have maximum dot map maximum dot map dot map sum. So we've fused away already a whole concatenation step because all we really want to do is just map the maximum, right? Because the maximum, yeah, there we go, another category theoretic slogan. Uh, the maximum um, of the maximums is, uh, uh, how, how do we say that? Uh, the, the maximum of, of, the, of, 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 the, of the concatenation is the maximum of the maximum, something like that. that that's maybe not quite as mostly dual as we like, but that, that's the thing. And now we apply a uh, map fusion. We take map maximum and map sum, and we shove them onto a single map. And now we have another function that looks almost as elegant as the first one, but slightly different maximum dot map of something else, not sum anymore, dot tails, right? 
So what we've done is we've taken some of the work from segments that was in that last element, and now we've pulled it into this intermediate thing. Right? And, and, and that looks exciting that we have something that tails. Because we had a tails fusion theorem, didn't we? So if I have a fold dot tail or a map of a fold dot tails, I know how to fuse that away. So but so we're not but so so that looks good. So we have max map of this weird guy. So can we turn it into something that looks like we can apply tails fusion to it? That's gonna be our next sub goal. Uh, the way we're going to attempt to accomplish that sub goal is we're gonna name this little guy here, maximum.mapsum.init. We're gonna name him MPS for uh, maximum prefix sum. Uh, we're going to apply equational reasoning there. We apply init fusion because we have maximum dot map sum dot init. So by our init fusion law, that's maximum dot scan out plus zero. Right? Things are already looking a bit cleaner. Yeah. You buy that? You with me? Now we expand out maximum. So we have fold our maxes <coughs> dot scan out plus zero. Now we apply fold scan fusion. Uh, here you'll note I said I believe the following is correct. I slightly generalized the statement in the Xing Shen Mu article. I took this far uh, to a more general one because I think there's an application of more general law. I mean, um, uh, I think this is correct. I haven't proved it. Uh, exercise the reader. Um, <laughs> uh, in, in the meantime, if you don't believe me, it certainly holds in this one case at least, uh, and then you can confirm it directly. But the more general statement is, I believe that if H and G are list homomorphisms, and H distributes over G in the following sense, right? that g of h, g of some x and h of y of z equals h of g of x, z, y, and g of x, z, mm -hmm. then you can always apply this fusion rule. Now in our case, we're taking um, h to be max, and, uh, no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of them is max and one of them is sum. I, I forget which is which in our case. Um, and, 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 and in that case, you can, make, you can ensure that the reasoning works for uh, uh, Yes, h is max and g is sum. Um, h is max zero. Oh, no, h is max. Yeah, uh, well, in, in our case, yeah. Uh, when we say list homomorphisms, they, then yeah, it's max and then it must be zero by the homomorphism. I'm sort of omitting the zero elements because they're induced. So yes, yeah, so I think this is a general statement, that if you have got sort of a distributive property among these two list homomorphisms, then you can always fuse them in such a fashion. You certainly can do so by direct reasoning in the case where you have max and sum. Uh, a note I'm going to make, by the way, is when you have these guys like uh, max and sum and whatever, they go under the general name of uh, tropical um, algebras or tra tropical semi-rings and idempotent uh, semi-rings, and they appear a lot in optimization problems. And you can take advantage of a lot of cool problems. <coughs> and the idempotency, which we're not really directly making use of here, but you often can, is that it's going to be that the max of x and x is going to be x. Right? So you, you can sort of iterate taking the max with something as many times as you want, and you can fuse that away. And uh, so yeah, uh, max plus and min plus algebras are really cool. Uh, and it's the official. Uh, so here we go. We're just going to apply that little result. And so now we have a single fold, right, which is what we're looking for. And in fact, we're going to, you know, we've taken this guy and we're just going to rename that little lambda expression into Zmax. And so now MPS4, right, which, which was, as you'll recall, maximum.mapsum.init, has now, by a series of correct steps, been turned into a single fold. Fold our Zmax of zero. And Zmax is, if I'm given two elements, I add them. That's it. And then, if the result happens to be less than zero, I replace it by zero. So it's sort of saturated, zero saturated arithmetic. And you can justify that heuristically. The whole point is, if we ever dip below zero, we know it's a bad carrier, and we might as well throw it out and start over. Right? Because once you dip below zero, then it's better to just chop off that whole segment. And, and that's all we've done here, is we've encoded that. And we stumbled on that by applying these laws. We substitute that in here. Maximum dot map fold R of Z max of zero dot tails. Now we apply our tails fusion as we so desired. We have maximum dot scan of Z max of zero, which was what we were looking for. Uh, but that is the cubic tunnel or whatever to uh, linear tunnel uh, through a series of uh, program variations. Uh, uh, 
Here's an exercise. Observe that while Zmax is derived from two list homomorphisms, Zmax itself is not a list homomorphism. I went from running a, behind to running ahead because I stopped having exercises and I started doing a little bit. So uh, it's hard to time these things, I'm sorry. Um, but, uh, do people want to maybe stop and look at this and poke at this a bit? Like, if I was you, I, I'd want to just fire up my REPL and try to type in some of these things to see if I believed it. So maybe just take a few minutes to convince yourself that these steps make sense. And if you're positive they make sense, see if your neighbor thinks they make sense. And if they don't, maybe help them. How do you know that the transformations you're making are improving your efficiency? You don't. That's right. The question is, how do you know that the transformations you're making are improving your efficiency? It's a great question. You really, there's an entire other branch of theory devoted to that question called improvement theory. Um, and, and the difficulty here is, is exactly the whole point, the, the entire point of this formalism is that you want to be able to preserve meaning while changing efficiency. So therefore, by design, You've pushed it out efficiency concerns in your equality relation. And, and, and therefore, it cannot be the right framework to reason about efficiency. For all those reasons, it's, it's, it's correct to reason about program transformations. Um, uh, there, there's something called improvement theory that attempts to sort of provide another layer on top of these sorts of things uh, that lets you observe that things are necessarily. Uh, oh, and uh, sorry, the story I'm going to tell on that is there, there, there's a particular transform called worker wrapper, which uh, there's been a lot of papers on. And, and one of the fun things about it is all their uh, titles of the papers sound like Daft Punk album songs on purpose. <laughs> um, you know, work it, wrap it, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and there's a paper on applying improvement theory to the worker wrapper transform. That's very good. And it talks about this problem. And the title is Worker Wrapper Makes It Faster. <laughs> Like not answering the question of how we know that this is going faster. But is it fair to say that if you see things like inits and tails since they're initial and you can think of ways to eliminate them, then you might be as a reasonable heuristic to start as happening if you want to? You know, yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely the case. Is it, whenever you see things like inits and tails, and yeah, and then that's the point. You see enough of these things, and it's not like you're going to go through the mechanical derivation each time. But you just start to get a sense of like, you know, just like, you know, many of us, if I see map f dot math g, I, I always know I should be smushing those, right? You, you, start to, you, you start to get a sense of like, well, here's a lot of other identities that I just have lying around. And if I see these things, then I probably should be able to fuse it. Uh, another point, speaking of which, uh, the, the, uh, the entire uh, framework of uh, list fusion in GHC, of course, is another, as is another small aspect of this work, uh, right? Because because the, the beauty of this stuff is, right, these are non-trivial transformations. They require insight. They require a person sitting down and thinking hard. But you carve out these subsets of them. And you could say, a, you could teach a compiler any sort of smaller, decidable subset that you can, and, and then that's, again, a case where you want to show that this subset of transformations generally always improves things, or at least doesn't make them worse. And, and then and, and that's why we only have some of these rules in the compiler and not all of them, it's precisely because. <laughs> hard problem in general. Uh, now I was just going to uh, ask that that's interesting that, that, you, that you can sort of automate a lot of these. Um, would it be possible to, <coughs> because you, maybe some of them work in 90% of the case, but you don't want to stick them in the compiler because sometimes they don't. So it would be possible to have um, some kind of macro, I'm using the term macro, even though I know that doesn't necessarily apply to Haskell, to, um, to like, have this sort of optional that you, you could use a bigger subset of these transformations. Yeah, that's, that's, that's sort of the rewrites rule system, which is a bit ugly, but it lets you do that and that lets you opt in to, to switch from what's called uh, build fold fusion um, with, with, um, to what's called stream fusion. 
and, and uh, the reason, but precisely because stream feeding has like one passable case, but otherwise is better than built for So there's been a lot of research on related things. That, that, that's one element now, is I think with this in hand, you should be able to go and look at build fold fusion and just look at the source of like, you know, the Haskell prelude and so forth and look at all their build fold stuff. And, and, and you should be able to apply these principles to that and recognize what's going on uh, very quickly. Uh, is that it, it, it's all an application, it's all putting things into a form where we can apply the fold fusion law. There is a way of observing that in the Haskell? Um, not, not in the REPL, in the source code. Um, let's see if I can pop it up. So here's data.list in Hackage. And, and I'm going to look at the source code. And uh, here's my rules. Now, let's pop this bit up. So this is a worthwhile thing I should do. So here's my rules for filtering. Um, is if I see something that looks like in, in phase minus one, right? Because what you do is in the phases you'll, of the compiler process, it will apply the first phase rules and the second phase and so forth. So in phase minus one, for all PXs, filter PXs, I rewrite as build a fold of this filter FB, right? So, and, and this is precisely right. I, I've, I've taken my function and written it as an explicit fold and applied it to a build, which is sort of a translation from a list into its universal form. And I rewrite it as that. And then I can write um, filter list is a specialized version of that, and filter FB is that. And so what happens there at the end is if I have a fold of a filter, and then I've gotten all the way from phase minus one to one, and I haven't managed to get that away, then I rewrite that back to my efficient filter. So th that's what it, uh, th that's how our rewrite rules work. And the whole point of the rewrite rules is somewhere buried in here, and I'm not going to pull it up now, there's a rule that says, given things in the form of uh, folds and builds, like something like, uh, like the build of a fold is applied to the build function to apply directly to the fold operators. So you can get a chain of folds and builds, and then you can um, fuse away a whole bunch of them in non-obvious ways. And, and, so, and, and that's another example. This, this fold build fusion is one of these subsets of these uh, program derivations that is shown to be at least never making it worse. And, and so therefore, that's why we can bake it in. But it's not baked into the compiler, right? It, 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 it's in user land. It's just baked into the prelude as these rewrite rules. So you can write your own rewrite rules to form your own fusion. And if you don't use program calculation, you can write rewrite rules to um, do things that actually aren't the same. You, you can rewrite fold to error. I wouldn't do that. But the compiler will it won't stop you. Um, it doesn't check this way. Is there any use in making that argument yesterday that it, at the very least full build doesn't make things worse? This is improvement theory that you mentioned earlier, or is that a different? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it was done with improvement theory. I, I just know it as a result. I, uh, I I don't know if I could tell you if they used a general framework or if they did it as a one off result. Duncan, if you're interested in fusion, uh, Duncan Coots, uh, his, his uh, PhD dissertation on stream fusion is, is now I think the best source. All right. Uh, so I, we're gonna. I guess we'll, we'll try to do parallel prefix on. Uh, this morning I realized that the derivation I give doesn't even get as far as I thought I did. It, uh, it, it's a very important, very much question. Okay. Um, how many people know what parallel prefix sum is? One. Okay. Um, so, 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 let's, so this is a surprising result if you haven't seen it. Um, we, we've, we've seen our scan function. It's also known as a parallel scan, right? And that gives me 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, right? What's the complexity of this algorithm? It's ON, right? Because I've got to visit every item in the list. And to get the last result, I must have visited every item before it, right? So it's ON. And then it's, uh, it's obviously sequential. Uh, the claim is, uh, what if I gave you uh, uh, as many processes as you wanted with free communication between them? I can do this no log -in. Uh, and so it is, to me, it is the first non-trivial example of a computation that appears innately sequential, but that when you hammer it with the right tools, it turns out to be actually very parallel and subject to parallel decomposition. Um, I, 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 I did the wrong thing here. I walked through a simple list-based derivation. It turns out that the interesting derivations for this 
but that really get you where you want neat trees, and I give a couple citations, but I, I didn't want to introduce a bunch more machinery, so. We're, we're not gonna get all the way there. We're, we're gonna get to a basic notion. And, and the thing we're gonna derive is not gonna be O log N. It's actually gonna, it, it's, it's gonna be slightly parallel. <laughs> it'll show you how you could be more parallel. Um, it's a proof of concept. So, so we had our list homomorphism, and we're gonna revisit that, right? H of X's of H of Y's is H of X's plus Y's. That's a list homomorphism. It distributes over concatenation. Um, the, the combination of the translations is the translation of the combinations. Yeah, that's just the um, Opposite monolith. We wanted to find a function. So I, I've, I've told you that we're going to write scan as a list homomorphism, because that's how you get parallelism. So we need to write a function scan op that obeys the property that scan op of two scans is the scan of the of the sum of the lists. Now that's sort of weird because how can you like these two things depend on each other, right? I have this list and that list, and then the, uh, I'm facing back. So this list is on the right. Um, <laughs> this list is Tuesday. If I'm over to how to, how how do angles work? Um, so. Uh, so I have the two lists, and yeah, the guy all the way at the end, he depends on everything else. So how can I have this operation that decomposes these guys in parallel so I can build up my log n depth tree of reductions? And well, we know one thing, right? We know that whatever it does, if one of the arguments is an empty list, it better just return the other list. There's nothing else to do. Otherwise, it's not going to be annoying, right? And so we can write the obvious case. The obvious case is obvious. Um, now what do we do in the other case? Uh, here we go. We take the laws of scan R, and we can observe this fact, right? That if we apply it to, um, if we apply the operation to some z and x cons x's, then we can have, apply the operation um, to the x, and the head of the scan of z, and then apply that to the result of scanning z over the rest of the instance, right? So I've sort of given you a one-step breakdown, right? If I know how to do it, and then I'm sort of, so, so how do we even phrase this? What we're just saying is if I know how to do it, if I have a list x and x's and I'm scanning some z with it, if I know how to, in, to know how to do it for the x comes x's, it, it suffices to know how to uh, do it for the x and the z component. Right? And if you were going backwards, when I said tail, we're, we're now going to do scans in the other direction because they coincide with fold rights, and that's what we're used to working with. You can flip everything around here. Um, if I know how to do it on this component, and I know how to do it on this component, right? I can sort of push over the one element of work, this x cons x, is I can sort of push the x into the z side and solve that side recursively and then solve this side. Uh, sorry, I'm not doing a great job describing it. This is something you just sort of look at the code and see what it's saying to you. <laughs> um, and yeah, here we go. Uh, no, that be the plus here. Scan our op of z of the concatenation, right? These are just more laws. We're just trying to write things down that we know must be true because we didn't, you know, we're trying to create some equational properties of scan by observation that are going to tell us things about how it operates in some sort of compositional fashion. And, and we don't know exactly how we're going to get to where we want to go, but we know that we need to produce these sorts of properties if we're going to get there. So this is sort of how you start to think about this. And, well, if I apply it to some list that is produced by concatenating two lists, x's and y's, then I know that the stuff that happens at the end, right, must be independent. No matter what I stick on the front, the end's always going to be the same, right, if we're sort of building up backwards, right? I've got at least one portion that's independent. And then that's starting to tell us something interesting, that my data dependencies aren't everywhere as I want, right? There's portions of data that depend on other portions of data. Um, and now, from this we include that, um, now we make an additional assumption. We put no assumptions on op. Now the, the, the op that we're scanning, right? We could be scanning plus, we could be scanning divided by. Here we're gonna say, well, if op is associated as pluses, then our scan function is going to piggyback onto the associativity of op, and then use that to sort of, you know, get a, a, a derived associativity property, uh, which is this. 
that if we map the operation onto the head of the scan over the first part, then we take the init, and that init is just so that we throw out this extra zero carrier that gets in the way. It's sort of a, it, it's really a detail in there. Then, um, and so, but, but we map this operation over the head of, uh, right, the, the second part, the Ys, the scanner ops Ys, right? So we solve something about the Ys, and then we map applying that thing we solved about that summarizes everything in the Ys into everything in the Xs, that, as we've already scanned the Xs. Then that's gonna give us our new Xs. And then meanwhile, the scan of op over the Ys is completely untouched, because as we've argued, it's independent from whatever happens in the uh, other side of the list. And now we have something that really starts to look like Right? We have a plus plus we have a, 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 on one side, and we have a plus plus on the other side. So we're starting to get towards this uh, decompositional property that we wanted to see. And in fact, and now we write it. And, and, and that's about as far as I got. Um, and there it is. Just by that property, we can write this. Um, this is a monoidal operation. Um, uh, you can write scan R as a map reduce um, using the scan op. You can parallelize it. Now, this is really, like I said, this isn't O log n, okay, because we, we've made a huge simplification. Right, this map of op over y. What happens when you combine the last two branches of your tree? Right? Well, this branch of the tree is going to be length n over 2. This is going to be length n over 2. So you still need to perform n, n over 2 work to map that operation. So you do save some time, and you're not. You, 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 you're saving um, sort of a, a constant factor almost because you, you still got to have an N2 in there somewhere. Now, now you can cheat and say, well, that's a map, so let's just do that in parallel too. Uh, yeah, I, I told you of infinite processors and cheap computation, so. Yeah, and that'll save you. Now, now, now it turns out that, uh, th that, so that there are ways to do so which are two pass algorithms, all the good ways to do it, um, in which you don't have this problem. Um, and in fact, so, oh, yes, yeah, so there's a point. If, if, if you, um, if you do this just with binary sums, right, what you end up with are the adder circuits that you see in slideshows. This algorithm actually is a thought, like, if you want, if, when you add binary numbers, this is what shapes do. That's how deep this is, right? Because um, you, you have your sort of, your, 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 your tree of carriers and adders. Um, uh, and uh, it's a very good test algorithm for a lot of cute things. And, and they do these two paths, upsweep and downsweep ones. And they avoid doing this extra work. But they do so with the two passes in a non-trivial way, because the first pass, you're not always the same in your rewrite rules as you go. The first pass doesn't give you what you want. It only gives you half of what you want. And the second pass has to sort of back patch in the missing pieces. So it's hard to do in this formalism. Um, I, I cite some papers that talk about how to do it. Um, but if, but I, 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 I couldn't think of a good way to present it. And so I, I'm sorry, I've left you with a very bad algorithm. <laughs> but I, I don't think you have interesting ideas about how you can think about these things. Um, and yeah, the Gorlach is the uh, uh, But that's about all I've got. We've now got about half hour left, so we could have some conversation and talk about some exercises or whatever you want. But thanks for your time. <laughs> programming birth book and do it start to finish. That, but that's very dense. Uh, the, some of the materials should be enough to maybe re-approach the functional programming with bananas and books and barbed wire. Uh, Gibbons has a bunch more papers that I didn't cite. Uh, the math and PhD dissertation is great. Uh, and then that's one of the reasons I like setting the earlier stuff is, right, like all good research, by the time you get about 20 years down the line, they don't bother to tell you why they're doing it anymore. They assume that you've read like, the prior 20 years of research. And so I'm setting the old stuff, even though for that reason, that it, it, it gives the motivation more clearly. And later on, they just assume that everyone already realizes. And of course, people don't. And I think this is very underappreciated stuff. Is that an alternative source for the bird book besides the expensive? <laughs> 
Yes, but not on video. <laughs> Maybe the publisher had print on demand. Uh, well, the, the, you can get an ebook. It's still feisty. Um, so, um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so on the jump from MPS one, MPS two, where you expand maximum um, to fold our max zero, um, does that skip lists of all negative numbers? Uh, the, the question is if you expand maximum yeah. to... Uh, because maximum of a list of negative 10, negative 3 is negative 3, right? But if you fold our... Yeah, 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 sorry, yeah this is a, a zero bias uh, maximum, it, it's not... Okay. A, yeah, you're right, that, 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 there was, that, it's not the Haskell definition of maximum, which is slightly different. I, uh, I admitted that, you're absolutely right, that in the specification of the problem, if I give you a list of all negative numbers, the maximum prefix sum should be zero, right? Definitionally, because I, I pick the zero, the, the size zero um, list is the maximum, and what's the sum of an empty list is okay. definitely zero. So. Thank you. So I'm new to this type of thing. What's kind of the state of the art of this field? I assume this is super simplified for us today. Where where is current research being focused in this area? Uh, the, the person who's done the most interesting things that I like. Um, lately, is Ching Chen Lin. And I, I took the, this version of the maximum uh, segment sum derivation from his blog. Um, and uh, he does a lot of stuff with uh, calculating from Galois connections, um, where, uh, uh, which is really neat. Uh, I, I think what happened with a lot of this like, is it moved from this sort of style of like, it moved from asking these questions how do we rewrite programs? into asking things about categorical semantics. And, these other questions, and, and, and they're more sort of researchy and, you know, sort of abstractly interesting, but, but they don't, it, it's harder to take that work and turn it back into, you know, how do I make my, uh, how do I make my map reduce so faster? And, and I actually don't know if there's as much research in that direction anymore. In a sense, I, I think after Bird uh, summarized the state of the art, People aren't making a lot of big advances outside of the sport the rapper stuff. They're, at least from what I've seen, I, I, I might be overlooking one of the things I've seen. Instead, it's like they've given us all these tools, and, and now it's just a question of convincing people that it's worth going through all the effort <laughs> of learning them. And it is. Like, I mean, you know, I, I spent some days preparing these notes, and at the end of it, I've shown you something that's sort of obvious, but I, but I, I do hope that you sort of appreciate that I've managed to show what, what, why it, it's good, and that's why I have the slogan uh, about practicing, right? Um, because uh, right, it, it, just like it takes you, um, you always should do a few road exercises when you learn how to add numbers to the kid, to accompany the concepts, right? When you learn things like this, some of it is, uh, is just getting concepts and looking at pretty diagrams, and then some of it is just you know doing these exercises one after another. Until, it, it, until you internalize the intuitions behind it. You know? So one of the theorems uh, sort of early on in the talk we were talking about um, the sort of unfixed theorems. Yeah. Is there any fidelity that's lost when you go from theorems about that to maybe trying to apply those same rules to built into school lists and treatments? So the question is, is there a fidelity loss when you go from these, quote, uh, these fixed point of function things to the Haskell things? And, and then the answer is the usual answer. If you reason in a total setting, then uh, there's no fidelity loss. If you don't reason in a total setting, there's fidelity loss both in a lazy and a strict language for different reasons, if you're in a partial setting. Um, so all of these transformations are true up to partiality. They're, they're true in a total setting. And if you want to reason in a partial setting, uh, there's a few ways you do it, um, and uh, there's a lot of research on, on those various ways. Uh, I mean, related work to this is also, of course, theorems for free. Now, now you want the free theorems you get are a subset of these theorems, a very small subset. But, you know, they, you get what you pay for, so. Um, I, I guess that's about it. Uh, uh, the question is domain. So, okay, so this is an interesting element. I will mention this in the Bird book. Um, they introduce three different categorical formals in the book. And then the most interesting thing when you do this work seriously is how do you internalize these notions like maximum and things like that, right? That you don't get in just purely sort of substitutional reasoning. And 
they move from looking at things in terms of the sort of category we would tend to use, where you just have objects are types and morphisms are uh, functions, and instead uh, they, they, they use um, relational categories, where um, uh, objects are sort of classes, and, and what you have morphisms between them are, uh, are relational, right? Um, and um, uh, or relations, right, and, so, and logical relations. So they use the framework of logical relations for this. Because you want to be able to talk about entire sets of classes of solutions. And then for maximization problems, you can thin them by theorems to the maximum of such solutions. And that means you don't want to reason over one arrow at a time, but sort of entire classes of arrows at once. And it turns out that that sort of reasoning also applied in a partial setting much more nicely. Than, uh, as well. So a lot of these results can, therefore, just doing math work in partial settings. But you have to uh, use these scary categorical gadgets called allegories, uh, which the bucket uses. Uh, never has a common set. Yeah. 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 Yeah.